name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudate Jesus Christus. In secula. We're here today with meeting a Catholic contributor, Kennedy Hall. Kennedy, how you doing, brother? Good, how are you? Doing very well. We're here again at Farmer's Hours. This will be premiering on uh, Monday at 11.30 Eastern Time. Right. So if you didn't, if you sent us any questions since Friday morning, sorry we didn't get to them. We only have one question, which we're going to get to in a second. But today's topic is pornography and the spirit of mortification. Again, part two, practicals. And we're going to break it into three stages, the three stages of chastity, single life, courtship, and marriage. And we're going to try to cut through a lot of the fluff, a lot of the uh, imprecise, reckless theology that gets thrown around, unfortunately, even by the bishops these days, which abandons the youth to their lusts. And this is when it makes me really angry because, you know, we're both fathers here and it yep. makes me angry when the kids especially have to suffer because they don't have answers to basic questions about chastity. Um, and even the, some of the questions about chastity that are answered even by conservative faithful Catholics are also off base. So yep. the, the biggest cause of this uh, sort of doctrinally that I see, Heather Kennedy, um, is the collapse of moral theology. And there's a really interesting piece that Ratzinger even said last year, 2019, when he wrote a little reflection on the sexual crisis and he discussed right. how he even, he even identified Vatican II as the central doctrinal issue, basically. He said that Vatican II, because of Vatican II, they <clears throat> wanted to abandon the moral theology that was hitherto done Right. in favor of one that was based solely on the Bible. And I talk about this in my book, if you're interested. We talk about, basically, they, were, they wanted to throw away all the scholastics that have been going on since 1100, and they just yeah. wanted to just use the Bible. But what happened was, they, when they tried to just use the Bible, they didn't have a philosophical system within which to understand the Bible, and so they're, therefore they, they turned straight to modern philosophy, for their for their philo for their moral theology, and that's what has caused. And this is what Ratzinger admits. He basically says Vatican II caused it all. He, he his yeah. phrase is um, because of. Um, I, I'm not going to get it right, but he he says this change renders the church defenseless against mm -hmm. the sexual revolution. That was his phrase, defenseless. And that was Vatican II right there. So that's Ratzinger. What say you, Head Kennedy? Yeah, I mean, the biggest change was, um, like, the, even I'm not even sure that they went strictly to the Bible, because it's actually pretty simple when you read the Bible, about like what you, what you should and you shouldn't do. I think that's kind of the, I mean, yeah, I think that's one of the covers that uh, that they use to sort of try to explain away the errors. Like, I have a buddy who's a who's a Protestant, and um, he was asking me, you know, where's the Catholic teaching? for birth control in the Bible, right? And I said, well, of course, <clears throat> there's uh, the positive teaching, like having children is always a blessing. So that should be enough that we shouldn't stop blessings from God because that's kind of a disordered relationship with God, right? But then I said, but then chapter 38 of Genesis, Onan spills his seed. I don't know what that means. And he's struck dead. I'm like, checkmate, it's pretty simple. Like that's the, you know, it's uh there's no gray area there. So even if they only went to the Bible, uh, they should have had a, I don't know, a stronger framework for it, but also to <clears throat> tell Marshall talks about this um, inherent in guys like Delubach and stuff um, that were leading up to the council. There was this idea that everyone had this natural progression towards heaven, just sort of naturally. Right. So even just their general philosophy of man had changed. Uh, and it was very much like, uh, <laughs> When you follow it out to its logical conclusion, it starts looking a lot like Rousseau. You know, man is good. Man is inherently perfect. Original sin is sort of a communal disease that we attract or that, that we, yeah, that we 
contract through interaction as long as you sort of just purify the surroundings man will be fine and everything is natural you know and that's kind of inherent in it so that's part of my two cents on that oh yeah yeah i I love that i mean because definitely don't want to denigrate the holy scriptures because they do they do make things quite clear um on many fronts uh you know i think of adultery as another very clear teaching um when you lost after someone with just your eyes, like, right. you know, you're married. It's like, well, that's pretty simple. Yeah. Um, remarrying, marrying another person, adultery, period. Mm-hmm. So um, there are a lot of explicit teaching, but there are a lot of other things that are not clear also. Right. A lot of questions that we may have in the modern context are different particular things that are mm-hmm. not worked out. And those all come from principles from the Holy Scriptures, which are worked out under natural law. Right. So that's how moral theology happens. So that's what they abandoned. They threw it out because they right. thought it was outdated. So anyhow, um, I want, so FYI, before we continue, this is going to be an R rated show. We're going to talk about specifics because they need to be addressed. And so if you're playing this near children or things mm-hmm. like that, be aware of that. Cause we're going to talk about the, all the details as much as possible here. Um, I wanted to address, we only got, so we have one question and, that was coming out of our charismatic show, uh, rather show on charismatics. It wasn't a charismatic show, but uh, it's this. Uh, this is, um, who is this from? It's from Bob Bungo. Shout out to Bob Bungo. Um, so he says, what do you think of charismatic laymen praying over lay people before they go for surgery, for example, or over men struggling with sexual sins? I've heard some say only clergy with consecrated hands should pray over people because we don't know what is behind people's sinful actions. Some might be oppressed by demons. Demons transferred could occur, question mark. What do you think? Um, well, truth be told, when I came back into the church, uh, it was through uh, an interaction with uh, Renewal Ministries mainly. That was sort of the big event, and they're a very charismatic group out of uh, Michigan, Sacred and, Heart. Isn't, it, isn't that Ralph <laughs> Martin's group? It is, yeah. Yeah, and Ralph Martin is awesome. I mean, he he, he's really great. Read, read his writing. He is a solid yeah. Catholic man. So, And whenever you, yeah. whenever I start thinking, ooh, charismatic, something weird going on, then I remember, oh, there's Ralph Martin. So, okay, there's something there. But um, there was a lot of laying of hands and stuff like that. <clears throat> so when I was, I had like never prayed before. So it was a very powerful thing for somebody to lay their hands on you. Um. I think partly too is is uh, when you're coming from a very secular, heathenistic life, like you, I just live like everybody else in the culture, and then to experience, um, like, what's the word? Sort of like uh, just true friendship and closeness, intimacy in like a non-sexual way with someone through prayer. I think that it's kind of just powerful on the human level. It's almost like you, it's like if you haven't. Uh, seen anybody for a long time and you finally get a hug it's like oh that was nice you know so i think there's definitely a psychological consolation there however from my understanding um when praying over somebody um it's you know it's like all things in spiritual life it's not like you get spiritual cooties just by touching somebody you know don't you don't just like attract it like a germ but you take the posture of somebody who has authority over someone and then at that point you overstep your boundaries if you don't have authority over that person so <clears throat> a priest can lay hands because a priest has authority over a lay person through his consecration. A father can lay hands over his wife, on his wife, I guess, and his children. Um, and I, I'm not sure, but maybe a mother could lay hands on her children as well, I would think. They have yeah, Ripper Gurr says yes on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jesse Romero talks about this a lot. He, he came up in the very charismatic renewal spiritual warfare sort of milieu. Um, and he said, you know, by the grace of God and my ignorance, I was laying on, like he was laying hands on people for years. And then he started working with Ripperger and that Institute that he has. And he realized who I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, I know one person who does deliverance ministry very faithfully. And this person, when they're going to lay, lay hands on somebody, um, they put blessed, holy oils on their hands as sort of a buffer. I don't know. That's, what they do. So I'm just saying I wouldn't do it. Um, I don't think that there's any difference if you're sitting right beside the person and you're praying for the person, you don't have any special power. So I think the prayer should be enough unless there's somebody you have authority over like a younger 
child or spouse, I guess. Yeah, that's what I've heard from Ripperger about this very thing. Um, yeah, you, you, and it's kind of, it doesn't seem to be a very uh, black and white thing because on the other yeah. hand, you could have a priest like Tomislav Vlasic, who is the priest, the, who was the spiritual advisor of the Medjugorje Sears, and he was prayed over by a woman, actually, who told him that he was going to be some kind of huge missionary and for some Marian movement. And then he, and this was after he had already fathered a child. I mean, this man is bad news. And then he goes to Medjugorje and he has this whole Medjugorje uh, craziness. And then he's not defrocked until like 2008. Um, So you could have, but I mean, he had a valid priesthood to my knowledge. So, I mean, he's still a priest, so he could have still been, you know, laying hands on somebody to do it. So, uh, and on the other hand, if you're, if you're a just man, a good, holy you know, if you're Jesse Romero doing, uh, being a just man and you're laying your hands in ignorance on someone, right. um, God would probably be merciful even if you're obstructing some kind of, black, you know, objective order, mm-hmm. you'd probably hear that prayer, you know. So, I, I mean, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's always going to be a bad thing. Um, I, yeah, I certainly wouldn't have anyone touch me unless they're a priest uh, in wife. prayer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, so yeah. And I, so I think that the, I mean, the, the main issue that we tried to address the charismatic show is that there's that openness to sort of mm-hmm. any consolation without that very strong objective discernment based on the tradition of the church. And right. that's where the danger is. So if you have this sort of general openness and so I just want someone to put their hand on me and pray over me. And that, I mean, that could, that could be really good. It could be really bad. So, yeah. I mean, I just wouldn't really mess with it because the spiritual world is just not to be messed with. So, no, and I would, just, uh, <laughs> there's an analogy I'm thinking of uh, when I, yoga, right? You shouldn't do yoga if you're Catholic. Right, so, exactly. Spoiler alert. But, <laughs> um, but uh, I read a priest's uh, reasons why, and they were very good. Like, he wasn't a traditionalist priest. He was just a, like, I'm Father Michael Schmidt's kind of guy. He's just a solid mm-hmm. conservative priest. And he gave the analogy. He said, okay, listen. People will say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm only doing it because I like the stretching. Whatever. Fine. He said, okay, well, imagine you had a friend who's an atheist. And you said, why don't you come to church with me? But don't worry, you don't have to believe it. It's like, okay, fine. He's like, when we go there, just kneel. When I kneel, just do the sign of the cross. Just say the same words. But don't worry, you don't believe it. Right? When we go up for communion, just, just bow your head and receive a blessing. Just say the prayers. But don't worry, you don't believe it. He was trying to make the point that no one would ever do that if they didn't believe something because they know that what they'd be doing with their body would be putting forth a disposition of belief and they're not comfortable with that, right? So in the same way, um, the disposition that you would go into laying hands on somebody, I mean, it's, uh, I've been around some charismatic circles and once again, I've seen some, some really great stuff, but I've also seen, you know, people who are like these conduits of the Holy ghost and you know, they touch somebody and they pass out and all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking maybe that's true or maybe you're playing with fire there. So I think the biggest thing with laying of hands is once again, it's not like spiritual flu virus. It's the disposition that you're taking of authority, which then makes you prideful and then opens you up to a whole host of things. So, right. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, hope that helps, uh, Bob, thanks for your question. Um, so let's try to get right down to this. Um, all right. So like I said, we're going to talk about three different stages, single life, courtship and marriage, but first sort of in general, let's talk practical, um, Mm -hmm. practical stuff, how to overcome the demon of lust. We talked about what is chastity? Chastity is defined by Prumer as the regulation of venereal pleasure according to right reason. So the, this right. moderation of venereal pleasure is a part of the concupiscible appetite. It's one of the pleasures. It's created by God as good. It's a good mm-hmm. thing, venereal pleasure mm-hmm. in itself, but it's so strong that it needs to be strongly moderated so that it's used properly. So right. um, I want to talk first good books because in, a, in the age of, of a lack of priests who read St. Alphonsus that we're going to talk about or read moral theology, or even trained by this books are really your refuge because the books give you the, the solid foundation where the priests don't even read these books in seminary. Right. Um, but two, so this is a lesser known author, unfortunately, but for, for some good reasons, but the, this is St. John Cassian. 
Okay. Mm. St. John Cassian is, was around 400. I don't know when he died, but he formed the basis for the rule of St. Benedict. And mm. he formed basically the, the basis of the whole Western spirituality because he, he transferred the desert fathers into the West. And he wrote two books. One's really thick. One's really small. This, this is institutes is a really great book because it just goes through the, at the time it was called the eight deadly sins because they separated pride and vainglory. Um, but okay. He basically breaks down the basics of the spirit of fornication and how to overcome it. Mm. Um, and Kennedy, I want to hear your your good books before we. Well, do you do you have for, before we talk this? Do you have any good books that have influenced you on this particular matter? Uh, specifically on chastity. <clears throat> no, I've never read actually a book specifically on chastity, but I remember um, trying to figure that out a few years ago, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, reading about fasting. Yeah. So we'll get to that in a bit. Oh, yeah, we'll get. Yeah, but, another one I thought of was a spiritual combat. That's another big one. Yeah. Because I'm just with this particular demon, you really have to fight manfully. And mm -hmm. so we'll talk about this. So Cassian summarizes it as this. He says, um, for twofold is the attack that rises in aggression, the attack of spirit of fornication, armed with a double viciousness. So this, this is a vicious, uh, powerful, violent vice. And it must be combated with violence he says and therefore it must be resisted by a double force since inasmuch as it gains in strength by the weakness of both soul and body it cannot be overcome except by struggling on these two fronts mm -hmm. and then he talks about some practical stuff so for bodily fasting alone so he starts assumes that you're fasting that's yeah. that's that's an assumption that we'll talk about that <laughs> so then he talks about Bodily fasting alone is not sufficient to procure and possess the purity of perfect chastity unless it is preceded by a contrite spirit and by preserving prayer against this most unclean spirit. And then by constant meditation on the scriptures, and to this should be added spiritual knowledge as well as toilsome manual labor, yep. which restrains and recalls the feckless wanderings of the heart. And before all else, there must have been laid a foundation of true humility without which there can never be a victory over any vice. So, so says Cassian. So that's a basic, uh, but first I think we should talk about fasting first because yep. this is, this is a basic assumption and mm -hmm. we've, we've been com so, uh, bitterly, ironically just deprived of the most basic weapon against loss is fasting because it's in the concupiscible appetite. Yep. So what do you say? Well, I mean, let's think about a couple things, right? <clears throat> um, so I'm doing the Exodus 90 right now and Mm -hmm. One of the things that you're supposed to do seems pretty simple is not eat between meals, which um, actually is pretty hard when you do it for the first time. You get pretty hungry and you realize, oh my goodness, you know, for myself, I grew up playing football and, and lifting weights and it was like, you know, a gallon of milk a day and 12 bananas and a protein shake and, you know, half a chicken. Like it was just, you know, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lifting weights. It was wonderful. Um, so I've had to really, that's been the biggest thing for me in the spiritual life is regulating those appetites because I went, I did that for, you know, even when I was done playing football, I started playing rugby and I was, you know, didn't have kids yet. So I was just always training like a professional athlete in the back of my mind. So I was just always eating whatever I wanted anyway. Um, <clears throat> but snacks are like 50 years old. Okay. Snacking is, I remember listening to a CBC, that's Canadian Broadcast Corporation special on when they invented like cereal bars, granola bars. And it was in like the seventies. Um, and they were invented for breakfast. Okay. And it was one of those old radio broadcasts. I don't know. It was kind of interesting, but the point is um, no one snacked until probably post-World War II, maybe even after that, you would wake up in the morning most often, um, you wouldn't eat right away. You'd usually do something. Even if you lived in the city, you might start traveling to work first. If you look at the European ways of eating, they don't really eat breakfast. and They have a sort of merenda, they call it in Italy. It's like a mid-morning snack around 1030, right? They have lunch around 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and they have a later supper. Um, there's a little bit of snacking that goes on over there, but not really any. This is why people will say, well, you go to France and um, the food is so rich, but everyone's so thin. If they just don't eat between meals, right? And that's huge. That's about a third of your calories to a half, depending on the day, especially if you oh. factor in sweet drinks and things like that. So even just that alone, if you were a Catholic before 50, 60 years ago, 
it was a baseline to you that you would only eat when you were hungry, which is huge. I mean, so many times, and I'm guilty of this myself, you know, I've sat down for supper and I'm like, I'm not even hungry. Of course I'm not hungry. I had a slice of banana bread at two 30 and meeting at five o'clock. Right. So that alone, um, we lose our proper re- relationship with food. Okay. And <clears throat> one thing you learn with fasting is that, um, hunger is not a sign that something's wrong. It's just a sign that you're hungry. Right. <laughs> like, People need it, like, you know, uh, hunger, if you wake up and you're very hungry, it's like, that's fine. Um, Just try going for a run or try doing some push-ups. And you'll see that you can still actually do them, weirdly enough, right? It's not a sign that something's wrong. It's just a sign that you're hungry. So then when you transfer that to the the sort of virtues of the flesh, okay, um, desiring something is not a sign that you have to do that thing. It's just a sign that you desire that thing and you can say no. Right. That's great. I love it. Uh, yeah, it's uh, put it in a historical context. Uh, before 1900, all our fathers did rigorous manual labor, unless yeah. you were super rich, and yeah. they ate less ton ton less than we do. We're just so soft and effeminate, we just can't stand being hungry for five minutes, yeah. and we think that's going to cause us to faint. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk. I'm going to do a ton of work on the practical things of fasting because men, we need to fast for Lent. Our fathers abstained from meat Mm -hmm. from Ash Wednesday until Easter. Yep. Every Sunday, every day, no meat. They Mm -hmm. fasted six days a week Mm -hmm. and they abstained from meat the entire Lent. That's how our fathers did it. Um, But we're just so soft. We we just can't even handle that. And we, we can't, we we must fast. You have to fast if you want to invest in the spiritual life. Otherwise, you're going to be a slave to your concupiscible appetite. And when you're a slave to your concupiscible appetite, you're a slave to the spirit of fornication. Right. So it starts with fasting. You must fast. If you want to overcome this 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 demon, you got to right. fast. Um, so then I, I think another, once you start fasting, then all you have to do are you already way ahead of the game in terms of lust? Just start fasting. Uh, the next thing you can do is, <clears throat> uh, I, I got to say this. Before. <laughs> the important, the most important thing with fasting is that you have to start slow. You have to start slow. Don't be tricked by the devil to just start fasting all day long because you're going to quit. You're going to fail immediately and you'll, you'll stop and get discouraged. That's the devil's trick. You got to start with one thing. Just start abstinence from meat every single Friday you know, then add Wednesday and then do every Wednesday and Friday and then start skipping breakfast. Just go slow, very step by step. But um, the next thing I would say is just take out all social media, take out yep. all movies and all music except for sacred and uh, classical music. And why? Because these three things are specifically designed to make you attached to, con- your, to your concupiscible appetite. Social media is designed to get your, all your likes. So you get these endorphins and you get attached to that and your concupiscible appetite. The movies are filled with pleasures and not, not, not even to mention the pornographic content in the movies, right. just even the, all the basic stuff of a movie has the concupiscible appetite. And then you take out the music, which also is the same thing. So if you do fasting and you take out all that technology, you're already way ahead of the game. You, you've already equipped yourself so much better than at most men to be able to combat this vice. Yeah. I mean, that's such a big, and that's a lot easier, I think, than fasting because you can just turn off your phone, turn off the TV, turn off the mm-hmm. music, you know? So yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah. What's um, Father Ripperger's Institute, I think it's called Libra Cristo or something like that. Anyway, they have a protocol when people are possessed um, uh, they, they consult with exorcists and things like that around North America. And uh, basically they've realized the most effective model for somebody to not be spiritually afflicted is to root out the, the sort of um, pernicious mortal sin vices that they hold on to. And usually it's sexual, right? Um, so they make them go on a 30 day protocol before they'll even consult them for the exorcism. And it's, you know, you can only read something like the, even, even spiritual reading, they, they cut down a little bit because it can be a form of distraction, right? So they cut down. It's like you can only read the mass readings for the day or you can read the Missal, the Latin mass Missal, which is very powerful to read, actually. Um, you can only listen to chant or 
sacred polyphony or something. It might only be chant, though, to be honest. It might even say no polyphony. Um, you know, no television. It's just basically what you just described. And they say they even have a, uh, you know, a large percentage of their spiritually afflicted, oppressed, and then sometimes possessed cases. Um, they'll actually be cured before the exorcism starts. Um, because the point is, is that, and they also have to pray the Angelus and there's things you have to pray, but the point is, is that, um, uh, you know, if you want to receive God's graces, you have to be disposed to God's graces, which means you have to push something aside in order for those to have space to come in. So even in the spiritual life for us, when we're talking about overcoming lust, um, the physical, like the physical is a way for us to make room for the spiritual. So if we are getting rid of our uh, obsession with what we're going to eat next, then we don't think about our belly as much. You know, St. Paul says their God is their belly or whatever, right? Um, uh, so then we can, it's, it's not that fasting is a magical thing that makes you chaste. It's that fasting is a virtuous thing that makes you a real man and content with your state where you are. And then you are more open to hearing things from God because you don't have all these distractions and interior noise. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's remarkable. I mean, when you just try it, it's like Exodus 90. Like mm-hmm. if you need, if you need the support, uh, Exodus 90 is in particular great because there's a very strong communal structure built mm-hmm. into it because you need to have a lot of men. Uh, I mean, like I, I'm a little bit more, sort of introverted it spiritually. So I, I just have one guy that I have says my accountability that we talk every week. Um, mm-hmm. But in particular, if, if you thrive in a much more sort of group dynamic yeah. as men, that in particular, I think is really great for Exodus 90 because it's, it's, uh, it's just a really great male group bond. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so the, so the next thing I wanted to address some of the things that Cassian talked about, which, uh, the, the Dom Scopoli in spiritual combat, he says that the fundamental axiom of the spiritual life is distrust of self and trust in God. Mm-hmm. And in particular, the saints tell us that this vice, so the, the seven deadly sins, um, with prudence being observed for occasion of sins, you know, if you're struggling with anger, mm-hmm. you, one method of overcoming anger is to find the person at work who annoys you and try to go talk with them and face that anger that you have and try to be patient with that person. Right. So, and that you can do that with all the other deadly sins. You can face them as long as you don't have a right. serious occasion of sin, you know, happening, but right. you can face that sin. You can put yourself in a situation where you're challenged. Uh, yeah. Dom Scupoli even says one of his methods is when you have an evil thought, you reject it and then you draw it up again and reject it again. And you draw it up again and you reject it again. So you're facing it and, disposing your will to be habituated towards destroying this vice at all time, except lust. Yes. You never do that with lust. You nope. never face it. You never draw it up again. You never, you always flee. flee. Mm-hmm. You never face it. That, and that's what people in their pride, they, they're trusting themselves. They think, uh, Oh, I can just, you know, have this, emotional you know i'm a married man i can have a nice emotional relationship with this coworker at yeah. work you know it's okay you know no no you you flee that or or yeah. you know i'm i'm sitting at home and oh i can watch that movie you know it just has that one bad scene i'll just fast no no you cut that out you mm-hmm. you root it out you flee you don't face it that's mm-hmm. that is one of the biggest lies is that and it's basically based on pride because you're trusting yourself you think you're strong enough but even king david a man after God's yeah. own heart fell because he fell trusted hard. himself. He fell hard. He, 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 he looked and he didn't look away. He wanted to look more. He, he didn't, he, you know, and then, and then when you, when that happens, the devil's going to come to you and say, Oh, well, her beauty is just from God. It's a good thing. You know, you should still look, you know, he'll just give you every reason you can possibly think. And you, you'll think it's so rational to continue, but yeah. always flee. Yeah. You must always flee cut out every single near occasion of any sort of shadow of a sin. Yeah. Especially that's why we talk about the movies because the movies pretty much, I mean, what you throw a rock and hit a movie that has yeah. this okay. content in it. Yeah. I mean, like one out of every two movies, probably. Yeah. I mean, you'd have oh, to like sure. see a war movie 
<laughs> and even then, some of them doesn't have it. It's just, there might be a brothel scene. Or it's something. ridiculous. <laughs> so, I mean, all, you need to always flee. That's, that's like the, in, the, in the fundamental spiritual axiom. Men are, um, I, I say this, every man is like a recovering alcoholic when it comes to lust. It's just your lot in life. There you now, go. When you meet recovering alcoholics, there's like kind of there's various types. Um, some of them can never drink again. Like they can never even enjoy a drink at a wedding. Whereas a lot of people, they didn't go. And that's usually people that like, you know, they lost their house because they drank it away. You know what I mean? Like they went, whoa, they went dark way down into the depths. But then a lot of people, I mean, functionally, if you have, I don't know what they say. I mean, these numbers are kind of silly, but you know, if you have like 10 or 12 drinks a week, which is pretty easy if you're doing a couple drinks a night, okay, you get to the point where they'll medically say you're almost like a functioning alcoholic um, because you're not having enough of a distance in between your drinks um, to know that you don't have to have it in order to sleep or something like that, right? No, you might not be because that's just, it's a little bit subjective to the person. But when you, you know, if you think about your average person who is going off to university, I mean, drinking age here is 19, right? So anyway, kids start drinking young here and, and uh, drinking a ton during university. They're not getting married till they're 30 or whatever. And they're just smashed every weekend throughout their youth. Um, a lot of those people I've seen that I grew up with, they pretty much ended up becoming functional alcoholics because they never cut it out, right? Whereas some people I've seen, for a time, they just cut it out. They just were like, whoa, I need to grow up. I'm having a son. You know, what's my problem here? Like I'm drinking 12 beers every four days. Like that's ridiculous, right? And then after they cut it out, you come back to it with a different resolve and they can have it responsibly. So they can have like a wine with their wife, right? So that's kind of like the conjugal life, you know? It's like, listen, you have to cut out all the opportunities of unlawful and immoral sexual temptation. Okay. Like it's not, if it's not your wife, it's not correct. Right. So you have to cut out all those occasions. Um, and then you'll be able to properly understand how, to, how to apply those in some cases, very good appetites with your wife. Right. Right. Yeah. So <clears> of <throat> the spirit the single life, we'll get in this just a moment. Um, the single life is about basically just beating back this demon, yep. destroying it, uh, so that you can enter into marriage mm -hmm. in control of your desires yeah. so that you, you can basically choose when it's appropriate. And that's what you need to be. I mean, that's what regulating the venereal pleasure according to right reason means. It means that your reason is in control. Right. It says, okay, now, you know, you're married. And even when you're married, we'll talk about this, but you know, you're not, you're not doing the conjugal act all the time. No, you, you are choosing, okay, now, now is an appropriate time for me to use my reason to, mm -hmm. uh, use that desire. Right. But most of this other 24 hours of the day, I'm not using that desire. Yeah. So you're still choosing, you're using your reason. You're in control. That's the key is that, so the single life is about come, uh, beating back the demon so that you are in control of that. Right. So, you, you, you know, and, it, and if you're called to be a monk, you're, you're sort of obliterating that and it, so it's <laughs> dead. So it's completely oh, dead yeah. at that point. So there's actually, you know, it's just completely, uh, so, uh, completely dormant. If you want to read about that part, go to Cassian cause he's a monk. He's talking about being a monk right. and dealing with that stuff. But it's very, I mean, it's the, the difference is because a monk still has those desires and he can still switch them on, but mm -hmm. he's just completely put them to death completely. He's so, control. He's um, but um, one thing that I wanted, so let's talk about the single life. So okay. we talked about fasting, just cutting off all unlawful pleasure. And really, and another trick is, is really the demons will tell you, well, oh, you know, thinking about your, you know, like your, I mean, I mean, they can, they can trick you into thinking like you could have, like you're a single man and you could just entertain all these carnal thoughts, but just think of it as if you're married and then it's okay. No, <laughs> I mean, the, the demons are going to try everything they can. You have to cut out all, I mean, it's really all cut out all venereal pleasure whatsoever. Yeah. And we talked about in the show last week about that. Uh, lust is a mortal sin. Lust is a mortal sin. Mm -hmm. uh, lust 
the saints tell us, St. Alphonsus says, no one was damned except with impurity, mm-hmm. at least with that sin. Mm-hmm. And what's the phrase from Fatima that she uses? Oh, more souls go uh, to hell for sins of the flesh than any other reason. Right. So let's this- marinate on that for a sec, though. Okay, please, please. Hell is very real. Yes. It's extremely real. And listen, with all due respect uh, to Bishop Robert Barron, we dare not hope all men are saved. Okay. Um, we, we, we dare hope that individually all the men and women that we love, we hope in that sense, like the Christian hope that we hope all are saved that we love. Of course, we don't look at the mass of humanity and say all men are saved. There is not a single saint. I don't even think even in the modern saints, you will not find a single saint, a single doctor of the church, a single theologian, a single scholastic, a single father, none who will say anything other than the majority of people are damned. That's just the reality. And it's a sobering reality, which we have to keep that in mind. Um, You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Of course, there's a servile fear and there's a holy fear. Okay. But I always use this analogy with my students. I'm like, raise your hand uh, if you drive the speed limit because you love safety. Right. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Like, no one raises their hand. Great. And great. They raise your hand because you think you might get a ticket. And they you know, it's like, okay, I'm a dad now. I've got four kids. When I'm driving in the winter, for example, um, I drive nicely because I love safety. But I didn't love safety when I was 18 years old. Right? I needed a servile fear uh to get me to not drive that way. Okay, so you need to keep hell in mind. And even if it's something that terrifies you a little bit, obviously you don't get all scrupulous and whatever, but it's got to sting a little bit. And, you know, you've got to wake up and smell the sulfur, as they say, right? Like if you watch, if you watch some illicit material and you do what people do when they watch it, and then you say, I'm going to go to confession tomorrow afternoon. And you have a shower the next day and you slip and you break your neck and you die. That's it. Obviously, barring some sort of miraculous application of God's grace. Blah, 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 blah. But these are exceptions, and we don't even think about those things because that's in God's hands, not ours. He's given us the formula. You have to die in a state of grace. So hell is very real, and the sins of the flesh are the most uh, uh, pervasive way that everyone will fall. So keep that in mind. That's just we need to keep that at the front. Yeah. Absolutely. Meditating on the fires of hell, the eternal fires of hell, damned for all eternity, no way out, deprived of God, eternal suffering. Right. Say those words to yourself when you're faced with temptation. You're right. faced with temptation. This is another very important spiritual device, which is, um, <clears throat> well, there's meditation. And I think so meditation is kind of your offense because you're not being tempted. Um, you're, you're doing a mental prayer. You're meditating on the fires of hell, praying the rosary, another very extremely powerful, perhaps the most powerful prayer because you're, you're putting your, your images into your brain, which are, uh, the good mysteries of our Lord, the mysteries of our Lord and the lady and their, and their virtues. And that's your offense. So you're, you're, you're on offense. You're, you're beating back the enemy because you're putting all the good images into your brain instead of all the evil images. So you, eventually, as you, if you pray the rosary every day for a year, eventually your brain will just go to those images and you'll just want to continue to meditate on Jesus Christ. Right. You'll just right. be, you'll lose interest in all this wicked evil. Yep. You know, when you cut out all the movies, you cut out all, this, all the filth and you just pray the rosary, you're just continuing to meditate on what is good. And so that's your offense. That's what you do when you're not tempted. You need to, and meditate on the fires of hell. Think about hell. Just, there's a great meditation, St. Francis de Sales in uh, um, Introduction to the Devout Life. He's Mm -hmm. got the four last things there. Read Mm -hmm. that. There's a, we'll link that there's a, uh, we have a number of articles on Meaning of Catholic. Uh, Kennedy has written four of those and read about the four last things. The four last things is an antidote especially for this vice. So that's your offense. When you are uh, not tempted, you need to go on offense. Right. Uh, so you need to take, take meditation, um, and that, which is so crucial. I, I heard Rippergert said that um, if you teach a child to pray the rosary, he won't struggle with impurity. Mm-hmm. And I, was, I thought that was powerful because just it's, uh, to me, I, in my experience and for what I'm right, I read that 
those images, when you put those images in your brain, it's so powerful. Um, yep. But I, but then I want to talk about, well, any other, any other offense you want to talk about? What other offense is that? Uh, generally speaking, okay, you've like, <clears throat> we got fasting and meditation. Right. So um, just, there's a book that I'm reading, which we should probably put in the show notes as well. And that's one I just thought of. It's called saints in the world. It's not specifically about chastity, but it's about becoming just an epic man, a virtuous man. And the theme of the book is, uh, you know, grace perfects nature. So that nature part's very important. <laughs> so it's not that, oh, if I go pray a ton of rosaries, then I'll somehow become some, somebody who's good at fasting. It's like, no. You actually have to just do the human virtues because you're a human being. And your humanity, when it's redeemed, is a beautiful thing because you're made in the image and likeness of God. Okay? So those four cardinal virtues, they're, not, they're natural. They're not supernatural. So you really have to cultivate those. Okay, so you have to just do practical things, practical steps. So, for example, um, I used to have a gym membership here in town or whatever I wanted, you know, like a local health club. Um, and uh, I was bringing my children. There was the reason I had it because it was a daycare and it was a really great price and I could go after work and bring my kids and whatever. And <clears throat> two things. One, um, you know, not pr being presumptuous, but by God's grace of after some years of working on this, you know, I can maintain custody of my eyes and things like that. Right. But I, I thought, why am I putting myself in a situation where I have to work so hard? Right. Um, and not even just like, even just vanity, even just my own self. It's like, there's just mirrors everywhere. And I'm like, well, I shouldn't. It's like, I mean, it's like looking at a selfie the whole time. That's just weird. You know? So that was one reason why I decided to cancel the membership. But secondly, um, I was bringing my sons there mainly because uh, I have four children now and, and my sons were around two and a half, three, one and a half, two when we were going. And um, I was dropping them off in the daycare and the ladies who ran it were very nice, but it was just sort of a drop off. Like it wasn't like an actual daycare. It was just more babies. They didn't change diapers and stuff. So I dropped them off and it was ages up to, up to age 12. Okay. Um, so there'd be some kids who were seven, eight, nine, ten years old being dropped off with their iPads. Um, and they would just sit in the corner. Very sad, to be honest. They'd just sit in the corner and just you know, look at their iPad the whole time. And I know the average age of pornography um, exposure is around eight or nine years old now, statistically speaking. That's the average, right? So that means some kids it's 11, some kids it's six, right? So I thought, if my kids see something, even as a two or three year old, because some kid has an iPad and his parents, you know, just aren't the greatest parents, I guess. And they're letting this kid have an iPad for that length of time in the first place. If they see something, that's my fault. It's not their fault. So when I had that realization, I thought, nope. And also I had cut the gym membership off and made a home gym. But then also I realized, uh, you know, there's like men and women are coming into this gym, just not dressed modestly whatsoever. And I'm taking my sons to a place and I don't want them to grow up thinking, oh, my dad is this Catholic guy. But then for an hour and a half, four times a week, he takes us to a place where all those things he's preaching against are normalized. So I just, I was like, I had to cut that out of my life. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't struggling myself. It was just why am I putting myself in a situation where I could struggle and why am I putting my children in a situation where they could be exposed to what I know is immoral? Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. And that's, that's, that is the issue. Like you, you can't really escape it unless you want to become a monk, which all the yeah. more reason to become a monk. But <laughs> if, if you're like yeah. most of us and not called to be monasticism, <laughs> then you have to guard your family, guard your own self, guide your children. Right. I mean, I hate just going to the grocery store. Uh, yeah. It's just, Magazines. Ter yeah, magazines, even the women there. It's just oh, it's so frustrating. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, another offense for men in particular, I want to say just lifting when you, mm -hmm. when you lift or like yeah. Cassian says, just manual labor. Like yeah. when you're exhausting your body, yeah. uh, that is helping to build. It's, it's funny, the, the psychosomatic uh, effects. You know, when you're building muscle, you are also building uh, mental toughness because yeah. you, you have to mentally uh, strive mm -hmm. against a fatigue that you have. So yeah. um, that, that comes to defense. And I want to talk about one point that in particular that is, is very important to me, and that is the Psalter. 
um, we're going to talk about in general ejaculatory prayers, which are mm-hmm. prayers where you just you just pray, you just pray even up. repeat something over and over. You may not even be thinking, you may mm-hmm. not even be paying attention very well. But when you face an attempt, face a temptation, that's when the when you need to use ejaculatory prayers. You need to just say prayers out. You need to start saying them out loud, or you know whatever you need to flee. If you can't flee, you need to start praying it mentally out loud, whatever you can to fight against that demon who's coming after you because those prayers are very powerful. The holy name of Jesus, uh, Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. Uh, Virgin mother, help me. St. Joseph, call upon the saints. Um, the, the particular vehemence with which we combat this evil is contained in the church's prayer book, which is the Holy Psalter. And there, if you notice, read through the Psalter there, the Psalter is very violent. There's mm-hmm. a lot of passages in the Psalter which are violent. They could talk about killing people, okay, mm-hmm. in the Psalter. And the saints all understood this, but when the reformers came out, they were imbued with this effeminate psychology, and they, they felt, wow, that makes us feel uncomfortable. So they mm-hmm. ripped them out of the church's prayer book. Yeah. So every religious and priest who prays the new office does not pray with the weapons that the saints specifically identified against this vice. Yeah. Think about that. Mm-hmm. All the priests and religious who are celibate, who are trying to cut off forever this vice, have been deprived by the church's authority of yeah. the very weapons that the church, <laughs> the saints gave us to fight against. It's insane. So, yeah. so it, again, read my book. I have a whole chapter on the Psalter. It's very important that we use the Psalter. And let me give an example. <clears throat> um, we go to uh, Cassian, and he says, <clears throat> he quotes two Psalms, um, Psalm 101 and 136, both of which, uh, in fact, one of those actually made it into the new office. The other one was, was censored. But um, <clears throat> he says, it behooves us as well to destroy the sinners in our land, namely our fleshly feelings, on the morning of their birth. That's Psalm 101. As they emerge, and while they are still young, dash the children of Babylon against the rock. That's Psalm 136. Unless they are killed at a very tender age, they will, with our acquiescence, rise up to our harm as stronger adults, and they will certainly not be overcome without great pain and effort. And so the, the saints tell us that these, these particular verses, uh, you know, with perfect hatred have I hated them, O Lord. Um, in thy mercy that will destroy my enemies and thou shalt cut off all them and afflict me for I am thy servant. That verse was re- removed from the new office. Um, these verses were given to, by God, inspired by the Holy Ghost, in particular about, against this violent demon. And those are the psalm verses which the saints have prayed against these things. In particular, these, when he talks about destroying the infants of Babylon, he's talking about the evil thoughts. That that's the suggestion and that's why you have to vehemently destroy the suggestion in your brain immediately. You don't hesitate. You don't uh, think about it. You just destroy it immediately. And so when yep. you're at the grocery store and you see a beautiful woman who's immodest, you immediately look away. You don't think about it. You don't hesitate. Um, you, can, uh, you can look away and pray Hail Mary in reparation for immodesty and just take yep. refuge in the immaculate one. Um, but you don't hesitate. You destroy it immediately. You, you, so that, that's the virtue that you need to be start cultivating as a single man uh, yeah. or woman. Um, you need to immediately destroy it. That's, that's the way of the saints because they know that as soon as you let that suggestion go towards a pleasure where you're, con- you're willing the pleasure, then first of all, it's a mortal sin. So you've already yeah. committed mortal sin because you are seeking carnal pleasure. Okay. Yeah. And then... It, it almost immediately goes into consent. So you're just immediately captivated. And that's why it's a mortal sin because it's so powerful. You have to immediately destroy it or, you're also, or you've committed lust. You've committed a moral sin. You committed adultery in your heart. So yep. I think that is the other axiom is that it must be immediate. And that's, it's just all about developing that habit. And men, if you're struggling with this, if you are discouraged, have hope because yep. the battle will be will be won and if you know and we'll talk about marriage as well as a factor mm-hmm. of that but um you know it it will not last forever you know following these steps these are the saints have told us for centuries they've overcome it and it can be done
Do you know um, Father Wolf um, or know of him? Uh, he's one of the main preachers on census fidelium. You know, he's a fraternity. Oh, I probably know his, probably know his <laughs> voice then, but he's quite good. He's very, very good. Um, he uh, was giving a sermon and he was addressing it to the youth of the parish. Very different than your average youth group thing. We're talking traditional youth advice here. And um, he gave very practical steps. And he, and he said that the precious blood is the greatest offense against lustful thoughts. Um, which makes sense because, um, you know, chastity is about being, it's literally being chastised. It's a, it's a, like chastity means you actually kind of inflict punishment on yourself because you suppress through mortification various things that are unlawful, right? Um, and the ultimate chastisement is the crucifixion in a sense, even though he didn't deserve it, right? That's the whole theology of that. Um, so the precious blood is the result of the most incredible example of chastity that could ever have taken place. So he says, and it's actually, I say it to myself, um, even when I'm just tempted to, uh, when I'm fasting or something like that, just any sort of physical temptation, uh, even if I'm going to start getting really angry and I'm going to like marinate in that faster heartbeat or something like that, you know, you say precious blood of Jesus, wash over me and protect me from the snares of the devil. And honestly, I've, when you say that prayer, the most I've ever had to say it is twice um, for the same temptation. And it's like, if you can imagine breaking glass and it shatters and goes away, like it's almost as if that happens to your thoughts. And it's very powerful because you're literally saying, Christ, cover me in your most precious blood. You don't get more chaste than that, right? So I would say that relying on the precious blood um, is, from my experience, the most effective ejaculatory prayer you could say. That's great. Yeah. 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 The uh, <clears throat> Oxilium Christianorum group that supports the exorcists yeah. say the litany of the precious blood every day. Yeah, um, exactly. And I mean, I, I hate to keep beating this dead horse, but we need to beat it because there's so few Catholics who understand that this is a dead horse, but the Novus Ordo removed that as a feast. So we don't yeah. even have a feast day for the precious really? blood anymore. Wow. Removed it. So, I mean, it's, mm. it's just remarkable. So anyhow, um, <clears throat> we should move on to courtship. Yeah, we should we just move on here. So, so basically, um, first of all, we, uh, <laughs> what do I want to say first? <laughs> so much to say here. Um, but first of all, the moral theology of the single life is any, uh, carnal thought. Now we're, we're going to talk about a very important distinction that you get out of comes from St. Alphonsus. Again, priests do not read St. Alphonsus in seminary. We cannot overemphasize this. Some priests do, um, maybe. But, I mean, so this is what the, the unfortunate thing is, if you go to a priest and ask him about the things we're going to tell you about right now, they weren't trained in this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they will not, they may not, they may disagree with what we're about to say, but this is coming straight from St. Alphonsus. So, um, doctor of the church. Doctor of the church, doctor of moral theology. She comes, so we should explain so, Whenever someone's a doctor in a particular subject, it doesn't mean that what they've said is infallible, but it means that if you follow that, you can't fall into error, right? There you go. So, so it's all safe. Like Saint Augustine, yes, St. Augustine, doctor of grace. Well, some things St. Augustine said have been worked out differently, but on grace, St. Augustine, he is, uh, it is without error. There might even, even on subjects where there might be differing opinions that are reasonable to hold, if you hold his, you'll be fine. Right. So with St. Alphonsus, there might be some stuff where you hear you go, well... Um, you know, just one quick example. St. Alphonse says you should never have your children share a bed if they're opposite sex in general. That might mm -hmm. sound obscure. Um, and you might be like, well, I mean, you know, but he's not wrong in the sense that if they never share a bed, then they can't ever fall into any weird sin. So it's just, it's just practical, right? Yeah. You don't have to say my children will never share a bed because I don't know what your sleeping arrangements are, but he's not wrong, even though you might differ, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. so and he also comes at the, the tail end of the scholastic period, which yeah. just pretty much closes around 1800 when French revolutions and other revolutions just take a part mm -hmm. of society. Um, yeah. So he basically sums up all of this wisdom that's been generated with the magisterium over 600 years. And yeah. so he's such a, 
great important figure for our time because he he's really kind of summing up so much such so much wisdom that's already been developed and and worked out by the saints and doctors um and then he's just sort of codifying in a very systematic way and so that's why he's the doctor of moral theology because he takes all this moral theology puts it all together in 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 his moral theology you know and so this is this is volume two of i think it's four volumes i think but the yeah. other two volumes have not been translated in English. They don't even exist in English. And most priests don't even know enough Latin to even study all these Latin sources. And that's what's, yeah. I mean, this is, this is the problem. I mean, priests, if you, haven't, if you haven't gotten this, you need to get with the tradition and receive your inheritance so that you can guide souls. And yeah. I, 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 I lamentably, I have to make bold to say that even to a priest, but this is the problem that we have. I mean, priests are, I mean, I remember talking to my seminarian friend. He said their moral theology was Henri de Lubac. They mm -hmm. didn't even read Prumer. I mean, they didn't even read these basic texts that everybody read in like 1950, you know? For, and so, for, for and so years. exactly. And it's just so sad that they, they're forced by their diocese to spend hours reading Henri de Lubac and writing huge papers in order to get their, you know, and then they're forced into parish life and they don't have time to deal with all these sorts. So this is the problem that we're dealing with right now. So anyhow, um, so basically, so the, the purpose of courtship is to discern if this individual has the requisite virtue to be my spouse. Yes. Yeah. That is the purpose of courtship, okay? Yeah. So the purpose of courtship is to discern if they have the requisite virtue and that is the key. That's the most important thing you need to think about before you get married. Is this person virtuous? Uh, yeah. All the other qualities are good. Beauty, good. Yeah, of course. But that's got to be subordinated to virtue. If you, if you very, very, marry a beautiful woman who's not virtuous, your life will be miserable for the rest of your life. You're so, done. <laughs> so you need to understand that virtue is everything. And, and, and so, uh, I mean, I, when I say virtue, I should also say the faith. That's sort of, I want to make sure yeah. that's clear. Obviously, that's you don't don't marry a non-Catholic. That should be assumed. Yeah. I should, but unfortunately, it's not assumed. So we should emphasize that too. But you marry yeah. a Catholic spouse who is virtuous. Okay, yeah. that's what you're trying to do with courtship. And so, when we talk about chastity, it's very very important because the sins of the flesh darken the intellect. So you're trying to make yes. a rational decision right now. So you're trying to have courtship, and if you just mix up with a bunch of sins of the flesh, it's just going to darken your intellect and you're not going to be able to make a rational decision. So, I mean, it's yeah. just for your own good that the church places these restrictions. And we'll talk about this, which has also been abandoned. Um, but that's the purpose of courtship. Would you, anyone yes. add to that? So, well, yeah. So when I'll tell my, uh, I do a lot of stuff with youth things, whatever, um, young people, not just at school, but through church things and stuff. And, uh, I'll say to the young ladies, especially, I'll say, hey, um, I'm like, I don't even care if you believe this right now, because they're coming from all different backgrounds of, of faith journey, I guess. And I'll say, um, tell whatever guy who's Snapchatting you or whatever, whatever guy that wants to sleep with you, uh, say, I'm waiting till marriage. And one of two things you'll see. One, you'll see like a him-shaped hole in the door because he runs out of the house so fast, right? Or two, you'll say, oh, okay, let's talk about that, right? If I don't, like I said, I don't even care if you uh, are devoutly Christian, but the simple fact that he's not willing to even consider that, it's like, you know what he wants. He doesn't care about you. He cares about your body and he'll throw you away one day and you'll regret it. Um, uh, so that used to be implicit in courtship because courtship is not dating. And we should say dating is about 50 years old, okay? Dating did not exist until there were cars, okay? So you think about the classic Hollywood movie where you know they, they literally go off and look at the Hollywood sign from the cliff and then they sleep together in their car or whatever, right? That is 50 years old because teenagers did not have cars until post-World War II or, and after the 50s mainly when they became cheaper. In the past, if you wanted to, to date, somebody you wanted to court them for one you had to go to their house because they might not, might not have even had a telephone if they had a telephone you had to call their house and probably their dad would pick up and you'd have to ask and say who you were because you had telephone manners and things like that okay you might have to write them a letter which is a chance their parents might have read it because it's coming through the house right um 
And then if you wanted to go spend time with them without a car, like you'd have to spend time with them within walking distance of their house. Um, you're not going to be traveling at night because you don't have car headlights and things like that. I mean, just the general societal constructs that were set up for just travel made what we would call dating basically impossible. Okay. And then you think about this, you know, if you're um, dating somebody, even in North America, right? 50, 60 years ago, you go pick them up at their house. You're not driving anywhere. Um, even if you are to go somewhere like a restaurant and you want to have time alone, you're going to be within like two or three kilometers of your house. So everybody there's going to know you. There's just a general like, accountability. It's like, oh, that's the, that's the, that's the Johnson kid and that's his girlfriend. Um, I'm going to tell his dad that they're necking when I see him at church tomorrow or whatever. Like it's just, there's just so much. So dating, dating in basements, right? We have this like basement culture now where uh, it's just insane. I'll, I'll, the kids will just be like, oh yeah, my boyfriend comes over. We just go hang out in the basement. Like, are you, are your parents idiots? Like, are they, they're like, no, they're they trying to be, be cool. They need to be slapped. But, but that is, but that is the sin darkening the intellect. You know, think about the statistics. I don't know. Let's think about your average, regular Nova Sordo parish. Okay. Just contraception alone. Let's just take 90% of Catholic. I mean, 95, they say they have or did. I mean, that's, that's kind of an inflated statistic because it could be that you contraceptive when you're 20 years old and have it in 30 years. So you're not, uh -huh. they shouldn't really count that. But most married couples are contracepting in the church. Okay. And it is a mortal sin. Sorry, it is. Okay. Um, and we know that at most parishes, confession is for like 45 minutes twice a week. And we know that there are like four or five blue haired ladies that take up three quarters of that confession when they talk to Father Bob because, you know, their son doesn't call them. I mean, I'm not saying this to be denigrating, but we know that like most people in your parish are not going to confession. And we know that most people in your parish, if they're married, are contracepting. So you just take those statistics alone. Most people in the parish are in a state of mortal sin. Okay. So now get outside of the Catholic world where there's even a chance of pr true repentance and state of grace in the, in the traditional sense of it. Most parents are in mortal sin. You know, I think about the stuff that, um, you know, one time, uh, you know, I was doing some youth group work with uh, like a kid who was seven or eight and he was telling me that his favorite show was the walking dead. Um, and I remember thinking, now, actually, The Walking Dead, I don't know if it has any immodesty in it. It's mainly just zombie stuff. But the point is, is like it's violent and gross and scary and mature themes. Mm -hmm. And here you are, and you're seven or eight, and you watch this show. Now, I know that his parents are not sitting there thinking, I'm okay with my kid watching something that's bad for them. They're not even doing that. I'm not even going to say that. But they're not making the step to... Um, I should be regulating what my kids watch because they're in a state of mortal sin and their intellect is darkened. And Peter Kraft, right? The famous you know, philosopher, he says, uh, quite simply put, sin makes you stupid. And it does. Exactly. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say this. Modern dating is the sexual abuse of women. Yes. Modern exactly right. dating is the sexual abuse of women, period. Mm -hmm. Women, you are being abused by modern dating. It, mm -hmm. is, a, it is a complete abuse and objectification. Uh, it, it, it should make every godly man burning with anger because yeah. all of our sisters are abused by this wicked societal norm. Mm -hmm. Because traditional courtship is all about protecting the woman. 100%. And that's and that's what traditional courtship is, and we're talk exactly in detail about this. I'll link a talk from Ripperger where he talks about the four stages of courtship in more detail, and that's an yeah. excellent talk. Go go watch that, especially if you think if you're going to date or if you have children, make sure they, you know, court. Um, <clears throat> and here's why: physical affection creates an attachment in a woman. It, it creates an emotional attachment because. Basically, uh, a physical affection from a man to a woman tells the woman emotionally that this man is going to be her husband, basically. It, yeah. it means yeah. it's, it's, it's naturally ordered towards creating an attachment to a man. 
And that's just a natural law thing within women. And so when, when a man has any sort of physical affection towards that woman, the woman becomes emotionally attached. And that's why women get hurt because they get, because the men don't have that same natural inclination. And so, and that's why marriage, marriage is basically culturally sort of invented, not invented, but created by God to restrain men and bind them to their wife and children for life. Because the, the, that strong cultural pressure on the man is designed for basically for his own sake, for his children, so that because he doesn't have a biological connection in the same way that the women have with the children, which is right. so fundamental. The women have a hard time breaking that bond, but men don't have a hard time with that. They have their, their biology and their, different. They, it's different. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, it's a different discussion. But um, <clears throat> so traditional courtship comes in four stages. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about distinctions from St. Alphonsus, which are very important. We talk about physical affection because everybody's like, well, can I kiss if I date? Can I, you know, what can I do? What's the line? And this is, I think one of the biggest questions for courting Catholics. And it's so sad that the church cannot give them the answer anymore because they don't read St. Alphonsus anymore. So here's what St. Alphonsus says. He, first of all, he makes a distinction between, remember the concupiscible appetite is basically all pleasure that's sort of immediate, whether that's food or the conjugal act or, or touching a uh, soft rose or something like that. So he talks about, on the one hand, there's the venial pleasure, which is the carnal pleasure. That's one type of pleasure within all the pleasure of the King of Optite. And he distinguishes between, so that particular pleasure and then sort of just the sensual, the sensible, not sensual and sexual, but the sensible delight. So just like, you know, food or touching a, this rose or whatever, you know, a beautiful painting, things like that. Those are, that's the sensible pleasure. Okay. So then he discusses how to seek out or to willfully pleasure in carnal thoughts internally is a mortal sin. And it is almost morally impossible to distinguish really between when you're dealing with a woman, uh, a, you know, some of the opposite sex, it's almost morally impossible to distinguish between those two. But so they're, but there is in modern convention. So like, for example, in France, uh, there's, or in different places in different cultures, you have what's called chaste touches. Okay. Mm-hmm. A chaste touch is a culturally accepted touching, even of the opposite sex, which are chaste. And mm-hmm. what that means is here's the very important distinction. The difference between a chaste touch and an unchaste touch is that the, the unchaste touch excites the sexual organs it creates an arousal in your body your heart starts right. beating faster your organs are you know aroused your your body is affected by that okay mm-hmm. there is an arousal in that which which and we'll talk about that that basically that type of touch is only in marriage right okay now that can be and we'll talk about this that can be i mean that in marriage that is appropriate at a given time. We'll talk about that. You could abuse it. But, you could abuse it. True. Yeah. And we'll talk about that too. But the point is that uh, a touch, which basically a touch defined as arousal, a touch, which, yeah. which creates an arousal can be, can be done in marriage, right. but we'll talk about that. And that's, a, there's, you know, we'll talk about that. But the point is the, the chase touches basically just cause a sensible delight as opposed to a carnal delight. The carnal delight mm-hmm. causes arousal. The sensible delight is just like, oh, that was nice. You know, it, it just, that's it. You do it. And, you know, so like in France, you, you, you kiss the opposite sex on their cheek or, uh, you know, yep. kissing the, you yep. know, traditionally kissing the hand of a woman, you know, these different things like that, which are considered to be chaste touches, which are, uh, you know, a, mo- a very culturally moderated touch where, um, you do it and it's, and it causes a sensible delight. It's just simply, Oh, that's nice. You know, and it's done. There's no arousal. Now, if you do it for arousal, you shouldn't even do it then if there's any arousal yeah. attached to that. But these are the important distinctions that are help, going to help define when we talk about courtship and what is the line you can't cross because yeah. St. Alphonsus specifically, even in 1787, I think these, these hold for today. He, he defines a chaste touch as holding a hand, contracting a hand, a hug, and a kiss, according to the custom of the country. Now, obviously, in America and probably in Canada, I mean, all of our customs are completely destroyed, so hard to really put any thought into that. But So here's the key. The four stages of courtship are friendship, mm-hmm. which is where you get to know someone more in a group. 
more mm-hmm. in a group setting. You get to know somebody. You're in a group. Especially around your family. Yeah, especially around your especially family. Around. You're hanging out yeah. with other people and it's in a group. Mm-hmm. You get to know mm-hmm. somebody. You know who they are. You know their name. You know what they're like. Yeah. Whatever. So there's some sort of attraction there. And, and it could be purely romantic, purely, uh, purely beauty. You, you may not yeah. know whether or not they're virtuous. And that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. But then if you are attracted to them, you, you, then you pass into sort of courtship proper, which is where you first, you, you need to ask their father twice. Okay. Unfortunately, yeah. we only left one still, but you need to ask their, ask the father before you court. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's the first step. Now, now remember we, these distinctions we're talking about, you may have a, a sort of like some kind of chase touch and sort of according to the custom of the country, like in, in America, I don't really like this, but in America, many hugs. hugs. Yeah. It's all about the hugs. I, I don't like hugs. I, I mean, I, a man, I want to shake your hand. I'm not going to hug you. Uh, women always want to do this little hug thing. I'm like, okay, fine. But I mean, but anyways, but that's still considered a chase touch. I mean, there's no arousal happening. It's a purely, uh, it's awkward so, half the time anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyhow, so you may have some sort of chase touch with this individual that you're courting already because you were friends or whatever. Okay. But when you're courting, um, there is, that's when you reel that back because, yeah. um, because courtship is a romantic relationship because, and if you, and if you continue to do these chase, even the chase touches, then you're going to create an emotional attachment with this woman because now she's romantically. So now you, you basically courtship, you, you kind of keep your distance because you're trying to make in courtship. What you're doing is you're trying to determine if this person has a requisite virtue to be married. So yep. if you're a woman, you are determining if this man is going to sacrifice everything for you and he's going to use his authority as a man to sacrifice everything. He's going to work hard so you can stay home and be a mom. He's going to yep. uh, not force you to work because he, because he, he can't make enough or he's not willing to work enough. Uh, yeah. You know, he's going to, he's going to die for you. You know, if, if some, some other person came to harm you, he's going to, he's going to put himself in front of you and die for you and fight for you and fight for your honor. You know, that's what you're determining. If you're a woman, you're seeing if he's going to sacrifice everything for you and use his head authority for your mm-hmm. sake. And then if you're a man, you're determining if, is this woman a virtuous woman? Is she filled with faith? Is she filled with humility? Is she willing to submit to me? Is she willing to, or is she a feminist? You know, does she reject <laughs> that? Because she's, I mean, so many, that's just pervasive, even Catholic women. So, um, yeah. you know, is she a faithful woman? Is she, is she pure? Is she chaste? You know, that's the other thing with for men, uh, women, you need to see if your man is chaste because that's the other thing is that, um, I'll, I'll let you go, Kennedy. I, I've been talking so much here, but uh, courtship uh, is is that the chastity requires the suffering from the man yeah. to be a man. Yeah. That's manly. You know, if, yeah. if if that man is just trying to put all this physical affection on you, it's mm-hmm. because he doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about yeah. you uh, because he's then creating an emotional attachment that he's not going to fulfill because he's not, he hasn't pro- I mean, basically a physical affection means this man has promised himself to me. Yeah. That's what the physical affection means. That's why we'll talk about that's betrothal is when the physical affection can really begin uh, in a moderated sense. But we're still in courtship. Kennedy, you want to add anything to that? I've just been going on. Um, well, one thing that comes to mind is uh, you have to go into what we would call dating, but we should call courtship with the intention to get married. Yes. And I remember bringing that up a few years ago to um, actually another thing, a side note, the proliferation of pornography is proof that uh, if you switch on your uh, attraction lens, I guess, then you can find yourself physically aroused by a multitude of different people. Some people will say, well, um, you know, what if I'm not attracted? It's like, listen, if you're watching porn um, or you're just the kind of person who goes out and chases women at the bar, um, it's just the mentality that you want a certain thing basically means you're going to be attracted to pretty much anyone who responds to you. Okay. So not that that, that's, that's an unhealthy understanding of it, but if we can sort of flip that and look at it at the proper sense, um, you know, um, 
you it's it's like the classic thing where someone will say well i was a friend for so long and then one day she just walked into the room and i was like oh my goodness i never knew for the last 10 years how beautiful you were you know she was the same woman the whole time so those things a lot of the time they have to do with how you get to know the person so that friendship part is important but also parents need to be encouraging their kids to get married younger um you know my wife and i we got engaged when i was 22 i would have married her when i was 19 we just were very secular in our families and as soon as we got engaged, you know, the first thing was, oh, you're going to have a long engagement, right? I remember thinking, I didn't have any framework for it. We weren't practicing Catholics. And, okay, I guess, whatever. I don't know. But I remember thinking, like, why? I just want to marry her, like, yesterday. You know, that's kind of the point of the engagement is so I can get married. You know, like, it's, right. it's like, it's a step. Let's get the next step going. Um, but we went through school, partly through school. I did two or three years of university and teachers college married and stuff. And you can do that. And it was actually easier than these people that were single. You share all your bills and all that kind of stuff. Um, but also one of the things analogy I'll give my students again is um, when I'm trying to teach them about courtship and I'll just say, listen, there are two types of people that go to university. There are those who have a goal and they want to get a degree in a certain thing. And there are those who go because they're trying to figure themselves out. Some, like the law of average is yes. Uh, some of the people who have a strong goal of getting a certain degree won't finish, but most of them will. They'll end up getting their engineering degree, whatever. They'll probably get a job pretty quickly. Laws of average is yes. Some of the people that go there to quote unquote find themselves, uh, they will end up finding something they really like and they'll get a degree. But the vast majority of dropouts are people that thought, I'm just going to take some courses and see if I like them because they have no commitment to them. Okay, so it's not that every time you are courting a woman, you're certain you're going to marry her, but it's that the point of the relationship is to prepare for marriage, which will do two things. For one, um, it'll open you up to, to uh, experiencing, feeling things that are holy in the right context, or two, you'll recognize, no, we're not going to get married, so you'll end it quickly. You know? And even when I was a kid, I wasn't raised with any devout faith, but I kind of had some faith here and there. And I remember when I was in high school and even then I had no language for it, but people would be talking about dating. And I'm like, yeah, but I just can't see myself marrying her. And my friends look at me like I had 10 heads. And I was like, well guys, and I'm like, no, I wasn't doing things properly. I'm very glad the confessional is secret. Um, but I remember thinking, but even if I'm doing this wrongly, the point is still marriage because that's kind of what you do just from a natural perspective, I'm like, why would I go and spend two years with this woman if I'm not going to marry? That's just dumb. Mm -hmm. Just on a practical level, it's like, that's just a waste of your time. Obviously, there's going to be heartbreak, whatever. Anyway, so for a couple things, parents, encourage your kids to, to court properly and to get married younger. You can go through school being married. Like, if you can go through school with roommates, why can't you go through school married? Like even just financially, if you get a one bedroom or a bachelor apartment and you got married when you're 20 to your high school sweetheart, you know, she's, maybe she's working, maybe she's doing her degree, whatever. You're still you're splitting the bills in half. It's a win-win, you know, uh, versus when you're in, you know, you have to rent a house with a bunch of people and whatever, and it's just a different thing. And then also too, there was a lot of trouble that I didn't get into when I was in university that I would have gotten into if I was doing like with my guys I was playing football with. If I was going to the parties with them after, that, you know, they were getting in a lot of trouble. I wasn't because I was engaged. I was going, you know, to spend time with my fiance. So, yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. I, yeah. All of this has to do, a lot of this has to do with gender roles, which we'll talk yeah. about. Um, <clears throat> another, I mean, basically, I guess we'll mention this now um, because the traditional Catholic moral theology that was thrown out after Vatican II said that yeah. the children have a right to their mother full-time yeah. in the home. So if she has to work, work in the home if possible. Um, but the, then the, the father has a duty mm -hmm. to provide for that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're both fathers and um, like, so right now my wife does work a job in the home like quarter time. So it's a very small job, but I'm trying, I mean, part of this apostle is trying to, is one of my side jobs trying to get enough money. I work a nine to five in an office as well as two or three other sh side jobs um, to make enough income so that my wife doesn't have to work at all. And so yeah. that is really women. That's what you're trying to determine. Is this man going to be willing to work 
as hard as possible, as hard as you possibly can to provide for me so that I don't have to work. It's a burden for, you know, when women really look deep down inside themselves, they understand with they if they cut away all the feminism, they understand that they, that's just another burden for them, you know, especially when there is children. Um, you know, if you don't have children, it's, it's different, you know, it's, I mean, working outside the home is a lot, a lot different. I mean, you still need to take care of the home, but, um, yeah. especially when you have children, the children have a right to their mother. It's a right, you know, uh, so yeah, you won't, won't find a working, like it's a touchy subject, but you know, my friend uh, is a teacher in a different city and, um, he's just like me. He's kind of an outlier. He's very devout. He's very open about it. Eva, you know, and, um, he goes, it's, you know, he's been to this school for about 10 years now. And he'll say, you know, it's interesting after five, six years, you know, in the beginning, some of these women that he works with thought he was crazy. And then five, six years, cause he has seven kids, five, six years, the biological clock is ticking. These women aren't going to have kids anymore, you know, in their forties, whatever. And they go, I won't say his name, but they just say, you know, we'll call him Jimmy. I say, Jimmy, I don't know what it was, but I was looking around my kitchen table last night and there were supposed to be three or four more heads there. Yes, there are fulfilling jobs. Of course there are. You know, a lot of women go into nursing and teaching and stuff and and whatever. And obviously those jobs in and of themselves give you psychological rewards. Of course they do, right? But there will be no way. You'll have to sacrifice something good and something virtuous and you'll have to sacrifice something that makes you more whole in order to have both the spouses working. And you may not feel it when you're 25. You might not even feel it when you're 30, but you know, there'll be a moment where you'll sit there and you'll go, you know, how did our oldest son get to the point where he was addicted to porn and he's 13 years old. And it's like, listen, you put him in daycare when he was six months old. He's been looking at screens for pleasure for the majority of his alone time. Because what? You got him in a Game Boy. Game Boy. That's how old I am. You got him a Game Boy. You got him an iPod because, you know, he has to take an hour and 15 minute bus ride every day and he's bored and whatever. And you got him a laptop so he could do his classwork. And, and uh, you know, if, you, if you're working, both of you, I mean, you see your children for like five or six waking hours a day. And a lot of that time is spent in the car and a lot of the time is spent rushing. Um, so you'll get to the point where you'll go, oh man. I basically let the culture, the schools, and even if the schools are good, doesn't mean the kids are good. I let the culture, I let the schools, let the sports teams raise my children. No wonder they're not the kid that I thought they'd be. Yeah. I, so and it, you have yeah, to think about that. Absolutely. Um, and so, and this is going to get into NFP when we talk about that, but I want to finish courtship. So we talked about, uh, so friendship, you know, just getting another person, you have a more romantic attachment. You may have a chase touch at that time, but that chase touch is purely friendship. There, there's yeah. no, or, there's no high five. Yeah. So then when yeah. you move into courtship, then you cut off the, you cut off all chase touches because the chase touches have gained a, a romantic element. Now they're not yeah. just like friends and friend or, you know, cultural societal norm. They right. have a romantic element now because right. so now it adds um, just a basic sensual. I keep on saying sensual. I mean to say sensible, meaning in your senses, in your concupiscible appetite, meaning that this is just something that is pleasurable. It's and it's it's fine. Uh, but then versus the carnal, which is the arousal. That's the key. Okay, the arousal, yeah. physical arousal. But you cut off both because you need to make a rational decision. Now, when you become betrothed, now going back to uh, Saint Alphonsus once again. Um, so he says, unchaste touches are not licit to betrothed couples, but chaste touches are lawful in non-private parts, i.e., no arousal, if yeah. they only intend sensitive delight from them. Otherwise, if they intend sexual delight. So, so basically, the, the courtship is about, uh, basically, you've promised yourself to marry. So, that's when you can begin to create an attachment in the woman. Because now it's not unjust. Because before, it was unjust. You haven't, you haven't promised anything to her. It's yeah. unjust. It's an abuse of the woman right. to give her any of physical affection. And, you, and men, you need She's to explain this. Object. Yeah, you need to explain this to the woman because she may have this expectation that she got from the movies that you're going to try to kiss her on the first date. Or just you need to explain this to her. And you say, "Listen, 
you are, I need to honor you and I want you to be honored. And I have not promised myself to you. I'm determining whether or not you want to be my spouse or I want to be my, your spouse, you know? And, and so I'm not going to touch you because I want you to make a rational decision about this. I want myself to be rational and us f- fulfill the will of God so that you don't get hurt. And I mean, yeah. There's a better way to say that. <laughs> I'm not thinking of better words here, but you need I to say that, saying. explain that to the woman so that she feels value because then she's going to feel like, wow, this man is serious about taking care of me. And that's that's what, that. right. So you need to say it while you're playing the violin and reciting poetry. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. That, I mean, make that more romantic or whatever, more serious. I mean, I, I sort of said it in a sort of coarse uh, way, but the point is um, you need to explain this and make sure the woman understands why you're not touching her. Because right. she needs to understand that that's because you're going to take care of her. And then yep. in the courtship, that's when you have, and then he defines it very specifically. He says, chase touches, which intend it, chase touches in non-private parts. So you are having a chase touch and then you intend sensible delight, not sexual. So there's no arousal. Okay. This mm-hmm. is the key. No making out, no French kissing, no whatever that causes yeah. arousal. That's the key. Heavy, that's the line. Heading. So, so you, you see, that, see, that, see, that, see that term heavy petting, uh, heavy petting. I always, Disgusting. I laugh. Like, I mean, I'm a 12 year old boy inside, right? I laugh when I sit on examination of conscience. My students are like heavy uh, petting. I'm like, so the key, oh, yeah, but the, yeah, the, the key is that arousal. So, so yeah. you, I mean, you can hold hands, you can kiss, yeah. you can hug as long as you intend sensible delight only and not arousal yeah. during courtship. That's what St. Alphonsus yeah. says. And that's yeah. because you're creating, you are, you are creating an emotional attachment. You are expressing that love because you've promised yourself to the woman. And so basically a betrothal is a promise to get married un- except there's, if, if there's grave cause. So you can right. break off an engagement if there's a grave cause. But at that point, you should have determined that this is a virtuous woman. She's a faithful woman. You know, if there's a grave, a grave, for example, I mean, you find out that she's some degree of sanct- consanguinity or whatever consanguinity so you actually can't have a valid marriage with her or you know some kind of yeah. or some other serious thing that makes it and we we don't have time to go into all the serious thing but i mean work that out with a with a holy priest but if you have she's a grave a democrat you're saying if she's a good democrat <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean that any so any grave cause but that's the point that's that is the point where the where the chaste touches which intend Sensible delight, not carnal. So no arousal. So the, that's the point of that. So that's, those are the lines to draw right there. Um, mm-hmm. And you can tell, are you aroused by this? And then basically the, 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 the basic factor that St. Alphonsus points out, which everybody should know this. I and mean, he basically just says, um, I think he po- it says passion and time. You know, so if you're doing this for a long time, um, if you're hugging for a long time, uh, where does he put this? especially if these acts take place with passion and time. Yeah. So passion and time. So you, you hug, you kiss, it takes three seconds to do. You don't continue to do it, you know? So, but I, I just wanted to say that real quick. I don't have a lot of time because we want to get to marriage, <laughs> but uh, I want to talk about NFP because this is typically what gets brought up when you start courting in most dioceses. Yeah. And this is where we already get into a terrible we already get completely backward by most diocesan rules, which is so terrible. They're teaching people NFP. So first of all, if they're following St. Alphonsus, they're trying to have chaste touches, which Mm -hmm. are not intending carnal delight. But then they put them in a room with all men and women, and they all talk about the gory details of sexual intercourse. It's like, you gotta be, you gotta be numb to, it's like when you talk, we like when they teach theology of the body to like ten year olds. Like, why are you talking about your body no. to these little yeah. kids who are filled with passion? It's insane. So, uh, yeah. so you're talking about these intimate details of the conjugal act to all these married couples who are trying to be chased in their courtship. It's just a recipe for disaster already, just on that on that front. Yeah. Um, yeah. But secondly, more more importantly, this is the key point. NFP is only for grave cause. Yeah. Okay. Yep. NFP is only for grave cause. Basically, there's tons of faith. And this is the sad thing. I mean, there's 95 couples already in mortal sin because they're using artificial contraception. And then there's couples who are also sinning against marriage because they're NFPing for a contraceptive purpose with a contraceptive mentality without grave cause. Yes. They're so using it as natural birth control. 
Right. Which so they, is a form of birth control. So putting NFP as a required course for a courting or a, a betrothed couple basically says, well, this is just normal. You normally do this. Everybody does NFP who's a faithful Catholic. Not true. Not no. true. No. Um, you, so, and, and as evidence, because if we get any backlash for this, let's just go to the, let's just go to the evidence. So 1853 was the first time that NFP was uh, approved or allowed um, by the Holy See, and it, it was a dubium sent to the Holy See back when dubium were dubia were answered. Um, so a dubium yeah. was sent. It said, <clears throat> certain married couples, quote, certain married couples relying on the opinion of learned physicians, that's a key point right there, learned physicians are convinced that there are several days each month in which conception cannot occur. Mm-hmm. Are those who do not use the marriage rite, meaning those who do not uh, do the conjugal act, do not use the marriage right except on such days to be disturbed, especially, here's the key point, especially if they have legitimate reasons for abstaining for the conjugal act. And here's the answer. No. Here's the authoritative decree in 1853. Those spoken of in the request are not to be disturbed, providing that they do nothing to impede conception. Right. Okay. So the, um, and then Pius XII summarizes this. Uh, in 1951, he says, this is from his address to midwives, I believe, uh, Apo- Acta Apostolica Sedis 43. But if you don't know Latin, you know how to re- look that up. <laughs> Anyways, he says, quote, consequently, to embrace the state of matrimony, to use continually the faculty proper to it, i.e. the conjugal act, and in it alone, and on the other hand, to withdraw always and deliberately without a grave motive, there's the key term, without a grave motive, from its primary duty, would be to sin against the very meaning of conjugal life. So yep. tons of faithful Catholics are being taught by that diocese to sin against the very meaning of conjugal life. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I don't know. Do you use Facebook? Do you have Facebook? Does it I mean do Catholic? Have so I, do. I don't have Facebook. <laughs> Our priest is an Irish accent. He, he always preaches against Facebook and he calls it van- vanity book. Or he calls That's it great. face. Vanity. That's exactly what it's designed for. Yeah, and he says Insta vanity and Snap vanity. Anyway, um, it's really cool having an Irish priest in 2020. It's like old school, but happening now. Anyway, um, so my wife is on Facebook, and she uh, was part of this NFP group. It's a fame. It's like a big group on. It's like 20,000 women or something like that, and um, she had to leave the group. Because it does say the women who run it are apparently are faithful Catholics, and there was like moderators, and you were supposed to take uh, like you if you were accepting to be at the if you um, request access to the group. So um, the stipulations were that you would follow the magisterium of the church, which sounds great, but authentic magisterium, ordinary magisterium, the magisterium of Francis, magisterium. I mean, magisterium. Word is very empty nowadays, unfortunately. There's just the magisterium and then there's varying levels of authority. But anyway, so uh, she had to leave it because, you know, there would be young couples who got married and they said, oh, we just got married looking for advice in NFP because we like to travel for a few years before we have kids. It's like my wife, she's a fireball. She's a fire breather. Uh, that's why we're, we're a good team. And uh, she would just be like, yo, you can't do that. Like that's contraception. And say, no, <laughs> there you go. No, that's contraceptive. We're, NF- we're NFPing or whatever. And it got to the point where she's had to leave the group because she was like, oh man, I'll read. She was reading the group to be upset, like to get angry. It was almost like that kind of thing. She's mm-hmm. like, oh, I got to get out of the group. But, you know, we'll talk to couples and they'll say, and they're faithful, like, you know, big families, whatever, and see them at marriage prep and things like that. And it's, oh yeah, well, I think we'll have three or four kids. I'm like, you're 24 years old. <laughs> um, now, I know faithful couples who have had a terrible time having kids and yeah. like infertility happens. And that's, and that's what NFP is for. Originally that, for, to help yeah. you conceive. And it's amazing for that, actually. It's wonderful for that. Um, they figure out, because there's a certain treatment that you can get called progesterone, and uh, it's basically like a one or two shot deal of hormones and it regulates a lot of things in women and helps them conceive. But doctors will never prescribe it because there's no money in it. And I'm not saying all doc- I'm not even saying that the doctors aren't prescribing it because they won't make money. It's just not something that they're educated in. Anyway, so um, 
But I'll be like, listen, you're 24. Let's just say you have average fertility. You're going to be fertile, generally speaking, for like 17 more years, more or less. Um, if you like, you might have three or four kids, but even if you're just being conservative, you're having a kid every couple of years, like you'll probably have eight to 10 children. Not that it will happen because of miscarriages. Yeah. I'm saying the conceptions, like you can't go into a marriage when you're a young couple and say, oh, we're going to have this many or that many kids. Like right away when you're doing that, right away, you're at least venially sinning because you're essentially exalting yourself. It's just pride, essentially. You're exalting yourself to a position where you're saying, I'm in control of my fertility, even though the Bible, to go back to what they desired from Ratzinger and Vatican II, even if you're just using the Bible, you will not find a single place in the Bible where uh, not being able to conceive is a blessing. And conversely, you'll find numerous, I mean, think the miracles with Abraham and Sarah, et cetera, St. Elizabeth, even in old age, when women conceive, it's like, oh my goodness, the heavens have opened up. We've conceived a child, one more soul for God to love. You know? right. So there's grave reasons for it, but they're not at the beginning of your marriage. Yeah, and uh, another aspect of it, and we're, we're, not even, we're gonna be able to, we're gonna have to cut this short. You, you can go to 6.30, right? 6.30 is your latest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're not even gonna be able to get into everything, but I do wanna talk about we'll do marriage, part two one day. marriage and the conjugal act, but um, another factor here is that marriage has two ends, the primary and the secondary. Yeah. And this, another thing was washed out. Now there was a phrase and I believe it comes in Humanae Vitae in Paul, Paul the sixth and in Familia Suarez Consorcio, uh, 1981, John Paul II. And that phrase is responsible parenthood. Mm-hmm. And I think that phrase is so dangerous because, yeah. and also in Humanae Vitae, he assumes that there's an overpopulation problem, which is even yeah. worse. So there's this, this, wicked thing and and i'm talking wicked because this is the type of thing that the the saints and the popes called it before this now we call it responsible parenthood but um the primary end the primary now there's super the supernatural end of marriage is the salvation of spouses okay Mm -hmm. supernatural order okay but in the natural order um there is the primary end is procreation the primary end of marriage is the procreation of children that's the primary end and by the way this is why polygamy was permitted in the old testament because that's right. the primary end because they were dying and they starving and they you know, had to have children. But it frustrated the secondary end. The secondary end is the, the good of spouses, the, um, particularly with remedy for lust yeah. and mutual support. So polygamy yeah. frustrates the secondary end and that's one of, in natural order, that's why it was abolished. But, right. um, <clears throat> but the, uh, so the secondary end is the good of spouses and the remedy for lust. And, and people are not taught this anymore because they're, mixed up in all this ambiguous theology of the body and not all that's bad, but there's just such such ambiguity and just imprecision and recklessness when we talk about this so that in the courtship, they're not given the fact that the primary purpose of this is procreation. That's why Saint, that's why a Saint soon to be Saint God willing venerable Pius the 12th says Mm -hmm. you're sinning about against um, the, the very sin against the very meaning of conjugal life. That's the meaning of conjugal life is procreation. So you're sitting against the very meaning. So people are not given that. So, so then they're, they're, they enter into marriage with this assumption they're just going to do NFP. So NFP is for grave cause. Mm-hmm. If so, it, you, need, you need to learn. I mean, if you're required to go through to NFP because your diocese won't let you get married, well, you have to go. But understand that that is only for a grave cause. And examples of grave cause that I've heard from Ripperger, and this is a grave cause is something you discern with a holy priest yeah. who – Read St. Alphonsus and knows what a grave cause even is. A grave cause is not that you want a boat, not that you want to travel, not that any of that stuff. A serious financial grave cause is like you're going to lose your house, you're going to, your children, are, you're going to starve. I mean, or, or another one that Ripperger has mentioned is um, when women have too many children, or not too many, that's a dumb way to say it, but what I mean by that oh, is you if you've had children so close together, the woman yeah. can have a mental state which is so oh, yeah. severe that it starts to just affect her ability to to fulfill her duties as a mother. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ripperger mentions like a woman just literally just going insane, like losing her mind. And so that's another Ripperger mentions that. Um, So, but those are types of grave causes. You know, if you get pregnant, uh, a knowledgeable Catholic 
physician tells you that it's going to, you know, threaten your life, you know, Mm -hmm. things like that where, okay. So you're, so even though the primary purpose of marriage is procreation, you, there, you are not bound to do the conjugal act at all times. You're not bound Mm -hmm. to, uh, be having, cause there are, there is a certain thing as St. Paul says in the scriptures, he says there is an abstinence that you can by mutual consent. Yeah. Um, and the cat's the key is mutual consent because there is the secondary end, which is remedy for lust. And that's why mm-hmm. it's a grave matter. If you refuse the conjugal act without a grave cause, because right. you're refusing a remedy for your spouse, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, so that's, that's another factor. Now, another important moral theology point is <clears throat> those are the two ends of marriage and those are basically the two ends of the conjugal act. Yep. So because there's a third end that people want to add in and think it's okay and that's carnal pleasure. So yep. as we talked about, the carnal pleasure is, it is a necessary means for completing the conjugal act. Uh, yep. And St. Thomas also says, taking pleasure in what is good is itself good. So when you do something good, you have a pleasure, whether it's intellectual or sensible or whatever, you know, it is good. The, so the pleasure itself is good, but you need to properly order it. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and that's when we go into intentions of the moral, moral theology. We talk a lot about what are the intentions. So, yeah. because when you have the, and the key point here is the final end, we, we might call the final cause. So the final end is where everything else is subordinated to the one thing, which causes you to act in a certain way. And it has been condemned by the Holy See. <clears throat> I, don't, I can't remember what year, 1600s, but Denziger 1159. <clears throat> he condemns the idea that pleasure, the conjugal act for pleasure only is not venial. Mm-hmm. If you read Augustine and Aquinas, it says that when you do the conjugal act for only pleasure, yeah. that is a venial sin. Newsflash. No, we should, yeah, like, and we should, because some people will say, well, if you know that you're not fertile that day. Well, yes, we'll that, talk about the second, the, I, I got the quote from Pius XI okay. there, because, yeah. because there's, like I said, there's the primary, the primary end is procreation. The secondary end is mutual support and remedy for lust. So those right. are the intentions that you need to have when you're having the conjugal act. That's, I mean, right. there's the intimacy and the emotional bond and the remedy for lust and the procreation. Those are all the good ends and pleasure is a means to those ends. It's not mm-hmm. the end. And like I said, you know, taking pleasure in the conjugal act is itself good in itself. But if you put that as the final end of the conjugal mm-hmm. act, and that's what causes this whole NFP contraceptive mentality, you want to have pleasure in the conjugal act. And you think that the theology of body has just given you this carte blanche to just, you know, go for it. No. That's not how this works because that it has to be for those primary and secondary ends. Um, right. So Pius XI in uh, Casti Canubi, um, he says, this is paragraph 59. He says, nor are those considered as acting against nature who in the married state use their right, i.e. the conjugal act, uh, in the proper manner, although on account of natural reasons, either of time or of certain defects, new life cannot be brought forth. So, you know, if you're right. just old or, you know, just not fertile, as far as you know, you know, mm-hmm. um, for in matrimony, he continues, for in matrimony, as well as in the use of the matrimonial rights, conjugal act, there are also secondary ends, such mm-hmm. as mutual aid, the cultivation mm-hmm. of mutual love, and the quieting of concupiscence, which husband and wife are not forbidden to consider as long as they are right. subordinated to the primary end and so long as the intrinsic nature of the act is preserved. So notice right. he never mentions that pleasure alone can be, because when you have pleasure alone, that's what causes all these other moral defects. Whether yeah. that's when you're seeking it for pleasure alone, then you're, you can easily seek it for a contraceptive mentality. You just want the pleasure. Mm-hmm. That's why the intention, you, when you subordinate all the intentions to the one intention, that's why it's venial sin, venially sinful right. because it's disordered. So, let me be clear. You can desire the pleasure, but yeah. you know, if you're desiring the pleasure, you need to understand that you need to subordinate that desire for pleasure to the remedy for lust because mm-hmm. you want to have a remedy for that. You don't want to just desire the pleasure only so that you're just right. using your wife or using your spouse. Um, but he says that you can, you can do the conjugal act uh, for these secondary ends, but when you do it for only pleasure, that's when it's venially sinful. Okay. Right. 
venially sinful. That's a very important aspect of this that's, again, been swept away. Yeah, and then <clears throat> practically speaking, think about it like this, you know, um, you know, your wife's breastfeeding or something, or you're doing the, or you know that it's not a fertile day, like reasons why you're probably not going to conceive. If you go into that going sweet, we're not going to conceive high five. It's like, that's a problem. <coughs> or if you go into it going, well, I love you. This is awesome. Um, if we had a kid, that'd be great. Right? Like you just, you're still open to whatever's going to happen. Your disposition is, this is the way the human body was created. God clearly created these cycles. So it's obvious that like just what you just said, that sometimes it's going to happen, sometimes it's not, but I'm not going to fight against it. And God willing, if something is to come about, wonderful. And I should say that, um, and that'll change your disposition on a lot of things as well. But I should say, uh, um, you hope that you don't get to the point where your wife is going to have a mental break. Okay, but you don't have to strictly do NFP to not get to that point. You just have to exercise this thing that men have lost, which is called self-control. <laughs> so, you know, here's the thing. And Pius XII, he talked about this in another document. I can't remember. It might have been in the midwife one, but um, breastfeeding, and not everyone can breastfeed, but majority can. Breastfeeding in and of itself gives a natural break in fertility time. Um, and then, like, if you're just following the natural rhythms of life, you're respecting your wife, you're having self-control. There'll be like me and my wife, we had two kids in 12 months and then we had a kid 16 months later and then 17 months later. <laughs> we had four kids in under three, three and three quarter years. But even there, like my wife, she's a trooper, um, but there's not like a mental break coming. All right. Because it's also just, listen, um, we're going to practice self-control we're going to have some natural spacing just based on the odds. You know, like there's only about 48 hours a month where you can actually conceive. Like it's not that much time, a few days either side, depending if the, the substance can live and, the, and whatever. But, but the point is it's actually not that easy to get pregnant. So if you just have some self-control and you treat your wife like a human being and you just control yourself through fasting, maybe have some cold showers, whatever you have to do, then you shouldn't get to the point where you've had 13 kids in 13 years and you work 60 hours a week because that's just, um, it's unfortunate that the Holy Father used the term breeding like rabbits, right? Because that's not really appropriate. But there is something to that aspect where it's like, we're going to have as many kids as possible and that's going to make us super Catholic, right? It's like, no, you should actually just be super holy and that'll make you super Catholic. There you and go. If 10, 10 kids come, 10 kids come. If three kids come, three kids come. If no kids come, then that's God's will in some way, permissive will, I guess. So practice your self-control fast. Uh, you know, um, think to yourself because you're in control as a husband. Like you have a role of leadership. Think to yourself, okay, we just had like three or four kids pretty quickly. Rather than making my wife, because NFP is a, is a chore, rather than make my wife check her signs like every time she goes to the bathroom and we've got to have like stationary set up beside our bed with stickers and charts and things like that, how about I just uh, be something other than like a wild dog? How about, hey, you know, <laughs> how about I just like, yes, you know, there's, you'll still conjugate here and there, um, but how about you just practice some self-control and have a lower frequency than the odds? And if you do that right. your whole marriage, then you will not have kids every five minutes. Anyway. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I love that. I mean, uh, that's a very important matter is, first, I want to say that um, the reason that NFP done for a, a, a grave cause is not contraception is because there is no infallible way to prevent pregnancy exactly. other, than, other than abstaining completely. Obviously, right. you would, can't get pregnant that way. But if right. you are still doing the conjugal act within sort of an NFP framework, it's still not infallible. You still no. get pregnant. Tons of people still get pregnant because yeah. it's a woman's cycles are not uh, perfect. They're not, you know, not always exact. Uh, they're mm -hmm. they're fluctuate. I mean, there's so many factors. And you, yeah. even if you're doing everything, you're doing all the charts, you're doing as much as you can, it's still not infallible. You still could still get pregnant. So yeah. it's not... Uh, 
so that's the reason why it's not actually contraception because as as Pius the Twelfth, I think Pius the Twelfth, or no, Pius the Eleventh, when he said, as long as the intrinsic nature of the act is preserved, so yeah. you're still preserving the intrinsic nature of the act. You're not doing anything to actually change the nature, the basic nature. You're still doing the conjugal act exactly as you would if you're trying to get pregnant, and you still could still get pregnant because NFP is not available. So that's the key that makes it different as long as you're doing it for grave cause and you're, you know, you're not doing the conjugal act for some grave cause. So, but the other issue, I'm going to try to close on this and then you can say your final words, Kennedy. And that's the Mm -hmm. order of charity because we talked about that marriage is a contract where bodily rights are exchanged. That's the the Mm -hmm. canonical definition of marriage, which again was thrown out in the new canon law, but Mm -hmm. is a canonical, it is the exchange of bodily rights, which means Mm -hmm. as St. Paul says, your, 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 uh, the woman's body is not the man or not her own, but the man's and man's not the woman. So that's the mutual submission. That's where the conjugal Mm -hmm. act is where they're both sort of equal. If you want to call it that way, you know, their, Mm -hmm. their duties and rights are completely equal, you know, in terms of the conjugal act because of the secondary, uh, end of marriage. Mm -hmm. But especially for the men, like you're saying, I love, and I love what you're saying. Um, you, uh, the order of charity is a higher obligation than justice. Yes. And yes. so you, yes. So like your wife is sick or your wife is not feeling well or whatever. And you're, you're aroused and you yeah. want the conjugal act in all rights. You can ask for the conjugal act because yes. even if the wife is some sort of, you know, moderate, like small physical discomfort. Obviously, if she's not bedridden or whatever, but she has a small physical discomfort, that's not a grave cause for her to refuse the conjugal act. But Mm. you are choosing justice over charity in that situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, and, and, and you need to know yourself. I mean, if you're overcome and you're losing yourself, I mean, maybe you need to still ask for the, ask for the conjugal act. And that's more of a venial sin because you're desiring the pleasure above all else. That's where that kind of comes in. But, Mm -hmm. Um, charity demands that you abstain from your wife, that you yeah. give her a break. You, Go for a run. You know, yeah, uh, that's that's yeah. the order of charity, and that's a higher obligation. When I said this thing about the conjugal, uh, the conjugal act, somebody on Twitter said, somebody on Twitter put, and if you're listening to this, please hear me clearly. He 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 posted my words, and then he said, next time my wife tells me no, I can show him this video. No, okay, no, you be a man. Yeah man up. And if your wife is not feeling well, you need to say no to yourself because that's the order of charity. And that's a higher obligation, the order of justice. Okay. So yes, you can in justice and you may be even venially sinning if you possibly, Mm -hmm. but not always, but, Mm -hmm. but the order of charity is, is a higher obligation. And so man of God, you need, if you want to be a man of God, you need to care for your wife. And yeah. that means forsaking whatever right you may have in justice for her sake. And you need to control yourself, have chastity and love her and take care of her. And that's why you wouldn't have a situation like we're talking about, like where you, you've gotten pregnant so often that your wife is just going insane because you've cared for her. You've thought of her when she's feeling bad, when she's sick or whatever, and you've abstained from your own rights as a husband yeah. because you love her, you have charity for her. Right. That's the higher obligation. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's funny when you run in traditional circles, so many traditional Catholics, they're trying to recapture something that they know they're supposed to have, but they don't know how to do it. So they just assume that, like, I'm going to work 100 hours a week. We're going to have 10 children. And they're all going to go to the, like, you know, uh, private Catholic academy or whatever. And it's like, well, that's not good either. Right. Um, so uh, do you ever watch the movie The Matrix? Yes. That's a good. That's a good one. I think that might fit the criteria. I don't know. I, I got to think. Uh, they maybe. they blaspheme. I don't. I don't like oh, it. They do. okay. I mean, there's okay. a lot of good elements in the story. In yeah, I, right. I watched it years ago, but um, they do blaspheme the holy name of Jesus. So I, I will never that's watch right. that movie. But um, right. yeah, there's a lot of good elements in terms of the basic themes, though. I, I right. definitely. Well, they, yeah. He's uh, his name is literally New Son of Man, Neo Anderson, and he's resurrected mm. by the love of the Trinity. With the love of the Trinity. Anyway, it's kind of interesting. Oh yeah. That's, so it's great. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, and um, there's a part where the one guy is trying to create like this virtual woman, and he says to Neo, and he says, uh, uh, you know, giving in to those desires is what makes us human. And no, it doesn't. Giving in to those desires is what makes you a dog. Okay, like dogs, they go and hump your pillow, 
right? Because they can't contain themselves because they're yeah. morons. Okay. I love dogs, but they're idiots, right? Um, you're a man. Tame the beast, right? Like you're in control because if you're not in control of your body, then your body's in control of you and then you're a slave. Okay. And I mean, we should maybe do a show one day about just the roles in marriage. Really understand that because that plays into this a lot. Yeah. But yes, we're supposed to mutually submit because the primary supernatural end of marriage is sanctification of the spouses. So that mutual submission is the bodily rights, but also you're both submitting to each other's mission, submission under the mission, right? You're submitting to each other's mission of getting to heaven. So it's obviously sort of a metaphysical submission. But then in the order of marriage, this is why St. Paul, like people say mutual submission. Yeah, but it can't be that there's mutual submission and hierarchical submission at the same time in the same way. You can have exactly. different layers of it, but it can't be in the same way in both ways, same, same type. So yes, you've mutually submitted. I love you. You love me. We're married forever, for better, for worse. We're in this together. We're submitting to the fact that now we are each other's in this marriage. Perfect. Mutual submission. But then in the order of the marriage, okay, listen, women, do you want your husband to be a leader? Yes. With all due respect, he has to lead, right? Um, do you, husbands, do you, want, do you want your wife to look up to you out of respect? Yes. Well, then in the proper order of things, she has to actually be looking to you as the authority, right? And we have to use Christ as our model, okay? Speaking about chastisement, chastity is chastisement. There is no greater chastisement than the crucifixion. Christ would have had, would have had every right, technically speaking, uh, when we're concerning, considering justice. He could have asked the crucifixion to stop, right? They, but what do they say? One drop of the precious blood could have saved the world anyway. You know, he could have had every right to stop and say, I, I want a beer or I want a drink. You know, he said, this is too much. And he wouldn't have been sinful for doing so. But instead he chose to do what was heroic. Okay. So as a husband, he has to be your model. And it's not just about what's just, it's about what is heroic. And choosing the highest level of charity will make you a hero to your spouse. And it will remedy so many of these marital problems uh, in our marriages that we have today. Primary place, especially in our culture, where our culture is extremely obsessed with sex. You can immediately take control of that aspect of your marriage and you'll start to be heroic in your virtue to your wife and it will transform everything. Absolutely. I can't add anything to that because it's so perfect. The crucifixion, that's, that's your model, men. Be Jesus Christ to your bride. Pretty much. Yeah. So let's pray. Please send us all your questions. Um, comment, like, subscribe. Um, we'll try to do more shows. There's so much, so much yeah. to say on this topic that's been so maligned and so abandoned by the church, unfortunately. So let's right. pray that we all have true chastity, that we imitate Jesus Christ, that we be men of God, women that you be given the honor due to you uh, yeah. by your men. Um, and most importantly, that, uh, the clerics of the church will rise up and reclaim the faith so that, yeah. so that me and Kennedy don't have to continue talking on YouTube. We could just be fathers and take care of our kids. Yeah. I don't want to continue to go on and on in public. It's just, it's, it's not my job to do this. Yeah. It's your job, priests. It's your job and you've forsaken it. So be men of God. Francis. Be men of God, reclaim the faith so that I can just be a father and I don't have to talk online and be yeah. public about all this stuff because it's been forsaken. So yeah. take up the mantle of Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. Let's pray. In the name of the mm-hmm. Father, the Father the Son, the Holy, Ghost. Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.